good to be going down the road with you again. Uh, we're going to get a chance to visit with a couple of people today. Uh, we're going to talk about water uh, in southwestern North Dakota. Mary Masted's going to join us. I've known Mary for a long time. If she's not wearing an absolutely gorgeous hat, I'm going to be mad at her. Uh, Mary is uh, one of those individuals where fashion matters, and she manages the Southwest Water Authority. So I'll get a chance to visit with her. Obviously, how dry it is. We got some rain. Uh, over the night, didn't we? Uh, we got some rain heading into this evening, and uh, for many of you, it might have even been too much rain, if there could be that, after all the drought conditions we're going through. Also, we're going to get a chance to visit with Josh Wall. Uh, we're going to talk about medical marijuana, and we're going to talk about where that's going in North Dakota. Of course, South Dakota passed recreational marijuana, and it's still not up and running. I don't know how that's playing out. You know, I don't. I was never a policymaker in South Dakota. I do know this: if you're going to respect the people and the vote that they have, and they say we could have recreational marijuana, then it seems to me they should have recreational marijuana. Governor Nome has done everything she can to make sure that they don't get it, uh, that it doesn't happen. Um, I think that that makes a, a better play for her nationally, or at least she thinks it does. But I, I don't know. I don't know. I know this, that, you know, that horse is out of the barn. It's going to be out of the barn in, in a lot of different states. And so it's it's just part of what's happening. Uh, you're going to see our guest uh, walk in behind me here a little bit and sit down, and he's somebody that I served with in the legislature, um, you know, that understands energy, uh, that, that really is out there uh, promoting and advising and doing what he can to make sure that the power grid is doing what it needs to do, and that's Tony Clark. He's going to come in, and uh, we'll get a chance to visit with him because there was an energy summit that was going on here at the Hilton Gardens Inn uh, in Fargo today. And so during that energy summit, uh, Tony Clark was part of it. Now, I know him as a legislator, and I know him as a public service commissioner, but we're going to make sure you know him in his role today. Commissioner Clark, good to have you back on. Joel, good to be here. All right, let's talk about it. Uh, the yeah. energy summit that took place today, what was your takeaway? Yeah, I thought it was a really nicely structured event. I mean, the turnout was was really outstanding. A few hundred people there in the audience here in Fargo, and and I understand several hundred more um, around, the, uh, around the region and around the country online. So really kudos to the Fargo, Moorhead, West Fargo chamber for hosting that but really on behalf of chambers throughout the entire upper midwest so it was, it was a great event great dialogue I, I think that says a lot too because the people that are watching us in in those other communities in bismarck and dickinson and and minot and williston they all threw in they all wanted to be part of it they all wanted that conversation to happen which means that they wrote a check uh and i think that that yeah. says a lot yeah, and you know, one of the, the interesting comments that I heard after the, the session with a friend of mine who lives in a different state, um, he said, you know what really impressed me was how the public officials in North Dakota, right to the legislative level, are, are really knowledgeable about electricity markets and energy and power pools and things like that. And, and I think it, it speaks a lot to just North Dakota elected officials. They take their jobs seriously. But it also speaks of the importance of the energy industry in North Dakota in that just like agriculture, if you're if you're going to be involved in public policy in North Dakota, you, you have to become conversant in the language of an industry that's that important to your state. Well, your job as a regulator uh, took you to a whole lot of different places as an advocate, as an educator. It, describe to people your role now uh, that you play in the energy field. Sure. So it's a little different. Um, most of my career was spent on the government side. I um, went from the legislature, eventually worked in the executive branch and wound up uh, two terms on the Public Service Commission, almost 12 years. At the, at the end of my second term, I was appointed to, by the President, President Obama, and um, uh, to a Republican seat on FERC. FERC is one of those agencies in D.C. where they have bipartisan representation, um, and uh, served a term at FERC. And for about the last four years, I've been now on the private sector side. I primarily do energy consulting with regulatory consulting with utility companies, talking to them about regulatory processes, how to uh, uh, work with the regulators that they, that they work with, processing applications, providing them strategic advice, doing some expert witness work um, in front of regulatory commissions now. So on the private sector side, but still um, in the same ball field. If you would have told me the Tony Clark that I served with in the legislature was going to want to live in Texas and want to live in D.C., 
I would have said no way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's well, not the Tony Clark I know. So there's a question of whether Tony Clark wants wants to live in uh, in the East Coast, which is where I've been for. It's hard for me to believe, but it was actually nine years ago this month that I was confirmed um, to the uh, to the FERC and. Uh, I would have been as surprised as anyone that I would have been out there that long. At some point, we we do hope to get back. We haven't quite figured out how to how to make it work, but uh, but at least I get to come back home on a pretty regular basis. So, your message to the conference today at the summit, what what was it? So, what I was talking about was this pretty extraordinary last year that we've had in the electricity space, which has, in some ways. Um, captured the attention of the public in ways that we haven't had events capture the attention of the public for the last 20 years, and that was the California and Texas energy blackouts. Um, probably the last time there has been this level of focus on reliability and on energy policy was the California energy blackouts of 2000, 2001. Um, this year, California and Texas our two largest states, two of our most prosperous states, two states that have very divergent political cultures in them, and they ended up in basically the same spot for slightly different reasons. But uh, So that's what my talk was today, is what happened in California, what happened in Texas, what are the lessons to be learned, and what can we learn from it here in the upper Midwest to make sure it doesn't happen here? All right, now i got to know yeah. <laughs> what happened in California, yeah, what so happened in Texas. When I look at, at Texas, probably more so than anything, because I'm thinking Midwest, I'm thinking of a conservative state where, you know, you would think that uh, the power grid that they've developed is based upon, you know, people that can supply. I mean, w what happened? Yeah, so two somewhat different circumstances, but there's some underlying similarities, which I think... Um, are important to learn from it. So uh, taking California first, which was at the end of last summer when, when they were really hitting their problems. What happened in California, um, remember that this is a state that has pushed very, very hard into decarbonization. Lots of solar panels built everywhere, a lot of wind resources, but solar is especially important in California. Um, they depend a lot on natural gas, probably a lot more than they would admit. Um, to keep the lights on when the sun isn't shining, but they've struggled to retain natural gas units. Uh, there really is no coal in, in California at all. They are um, surprisingly, I guess, if, you, if you're concerned about carbon emissions, they are shutting down a lot of nuclear, which is the nation's largest source of carbon-free electricity. In California, um, if you go back 10 years ago, th there were about 4,400 megawatts of nuclear power online, and by 2025, there's going to be zero. Um, so they are uh, rapidly shutting that down. Um, and what happened in, in California was, uh, interestingly, they had enough energy to meet the peak of their demand during those days. So when, the, when those air conditioning units were running the highest in California, and it was hot days at the end of summer, they actually had more than enough energy to meet the peak. What they didn't have enough for was when the sun went down, all the solar resources went away. The gas plants they thought would be able to show up, a lot of them had retired or weren't there, weren't able to produce, and they were depending on a lot of uh, resources from the rest of the West being imported into California, but guess what? The rest of the West was using that energy at the time. <laughs> they didn't have any to give to California. So that was, uh, it was a failure of planning, it was um, a failure of expectations. Um, in terms of how they thought the grid would would perform. Um, but a lot at the heart of it, I think a lot of it was they, and this stems back to the, the old California energy crisis, remember California utilities were forced to divest themselves of generation. So for the most part, the utilities don't own generation in California. They have to procure it from the market. They have to enter into long-term contracts with different developers. But it it has meant that responsibility for keeping the lights on has has been split up amongst a lot of different entities, and that makes it very difficult to do during times of stress. Um, Texas was a little bit different. Texas is a very gas-dependent region of the country. They have a lot of natural gas. They have a lot of wind, too, um, but a lot of natural gas. Uh, wind, during the Texas energy crisis, actually performed about as everyone thought it would perform, which is to say there wasn't a lot of it that showed up. I mean, the, the way that engineers model wind is they know during extreme cold weather, and we all know this in the in the northern plains, during extreme cold weather events, it's usually you have a lot of high pressure in place. There's not a lot of wind. It might get really, really, really cold, but there may not be that much wind on those minus 30 degree days. Um, 
And so they weren't planning on a lot of wind to be there, but they were planning on the dispatchable resources, um, gas, some coal, some nuclear, to be able to, to perform. They weren't because at least at the, the most immediate cause, a lot of those plants were not winterized. They didn't have the, uh, the, all those things that we do here on the Northern Plains to keep units running when it gets really, really cold in place. Certain units started not showing up. That was happening at the same time that, that homes and, and, and residential consumers were drawing more and more natural gas into their furnaces, and it just created this vicious cycle where um, the power generators couldn't get the gas because the gas was going somewhere else. That would cause a power generator to go off, which would cause there to be a need for even more natural gas somewhere on the system. The coal units, the nuclear units were freezing up. So really a, a, a bad cycle. I would argue that um, while that's all the, the immediate cause, what really got them in the place where it became such a problem is, uh, again, market design and, and structure of the market. Texas has totally deregulated their energy um, system. They uh, believe that if you um, just let market prices go as high as they will go, that that in and of itself will build enough generation resources to be able to meet those times of stress. Um, so they really approach their entire grid differently than we do in the upper Midwest. Here, uh, North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, um, and in much of the country, you still have regulated utilities that have an obligation to serve and to build, to build extra headroom into the system. So when you have those really cold days, uh, you've, got, you've got that much more cushion to be able to absorb it. And the, the trade-off in Texas was we're going to run a really razor-tight uh, market with very thin margins and we just hope that if we let prices go really really high that that resources will show up and what we found is that uh, it didn't matter how high the price was they just weren't available to produce when we come back I want to find out why California went away from nuclear you know the the word itself seems to conjure up some images yeah. of and people don't understand I think what nuclear does or could do and it's interesting that California did that when it has zero carbon footprint. Uh, and also, I want to talk about, well, you know, Texas when it comes to the overall planning. We went, um, Tony, from, you know, crops freezing here in the Upper Plains to 100 degrees. Yeah. I mean, people don't understand how to prepare for extreme weather. Um, and you know what was happening last night? My air conditioner was working, so it was a good day. Uh, when we come back, we're going to get a chance to visit with uh, Tony Clark some more right here as we go down the road. Howdy, folks. It's the Caneline Cafe. I reckon it's time you'll do for a hot meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at a salad bar. Sink your teeth into our famous Caneline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a calm roll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Hi, it's me, Anthony Sullivan. And yes, you've actually caught me at home relaxing because life's been pretty worry-free since I got coverage with American Residential Warranty. You won't believe what ARW covers. Heating and air conditioning, washers and dryers, kitchen appliances, plumbing, water heaters, electrical systems, flat screens and laptops, even pools and spas, and so much more. Call American Residential Warranty. They'll get you covered. 1-800-219-1467. Hi, Hunter Ellis here for Night Hero Binoculars by Atomic Beam. These binoculars let you see anything, even in pitch black darkness. Gotcha. The secrets are powerful wide angle atomic beam laser that reveals objects up to 150 yards away hidden by darkness. During the day, Night Hero gives you 10 times magnification. And when the sun goes down, press the Night Bright button to see clearly in the dark. Light up garbage eating critters or spot thieves before they even get close. Call or click now and get Night Hero binoculars for just $39.99. Order right now and you can double it. Plus, get our best-selling atomic beam flashlight. Just pay a separate fee. We'll even ship them to you free. This TV special offer is not available on Amazon. You can get it all, but you have to order now. Call 1-800-619-1091. That's 1-800-619-1091. Or visit ByNightHero.com. That's ByNightHero.com. Order now. <laughs> 
Attention, have you or a loved one suffered from maculopathy, a serious retinal injury, after taking the prescription drug Elmiron for interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome? In 2018, a researcher at the Emory School of Medicine linked Elmiron, a prescription drug that treats interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome, to maculopathy, which is sight-threatening and can cause an abrupt change of vision. Call Elmiron Justice for a free legal consultation. Please call 800-395-5680. Not attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. This drug remains approved by the FDA. If you or a loved one regularly took Zantac and were later diagnosed with cancer, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. Potential cancers include bladder cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer. Do not stop taking a prescribed medication without first consulting with your doctor. Discontinuing a prescribed medication without your doctor's advice can result in injury or death. Call 1-800-230-9210. Welcome back to Down the Road, having a, a great conversation with Tony Clark, a man who, if you look at the energy industry and you look at uh, a man who began as a legislator, then went on to the North Dakota's Public Service Commission and then went on to roles uh, at, a, at a national level, you're looking at somebody who truly knows energy at, at all different levels. We were talking uh, about, you know, the, the, the states. Before the break, we were talking about California and its problem with its blackouts. We were talking about Texas and what it went through with loss of life and complete property de devastation in certain areas. Um, in, in California, you said that uh, they have decided to go 100% uh, with no nuclear. Why? Why did they do that? <laughs> yeah, and, and part of it, Joel, I, I don't know how much was a plan sort of thoughtful, we're going to be shutting down these nukes, how much was circumstance, how much was the way the markets are designed that, that don't often compensate nuclear generation as they probably should. So it was a combination of factors, but I agree with the premise of your question, which is if you are concerned about carbon in the, in the environment, the, the one single largest dispatchable resource that we have available today that doesn't produce any carbon is nuclear power. Um, and it, we take advantage of that in the upper Midwest, um, XL Energy, which serves, of course, mm -hmm. a good chunk of the eastern part of the state, although they don't have any nuclear units here in North Dakota, have two units in Minnesota that serves the, uh, the regional grid, and North Dakota customers help pay for, for those units. Um, in California, um, part of it was environmental pushback. Uh, nuclear units there's a caucus of, of folks out there who want nuclear <laughs> but shut <why>? down <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna it's, fire uh, fight it yeah. from an environmental standpoint why I mean I can yeah. I, I, I can see a debate or I would guess there'd be a debate about safety issues uh, yeah. you know because of old and old you have times. to have safety right yeah and you got to have safety I mean nuclear power can be dangerous I, yeah. I get it I understand it but how in the world can you fight nuclear power on an environmental standpoint? Yeah, so I would say, and this is my characterization of it, I think more responsible environmental groups are saying, look, there's a, there's a role for nuclear power. We just, we can't make a transition to a carbon-free grid with, without it reasonably. There are less pragmatic, shall we say, environmental <laughs> groups who don't see, I mean, they just, you know, think the whole system can run on nothing but intermittent resources. I think they're wrong, and I think most engineers think they're wrong. Um, and, but so part of it's that um, part of it was just bad circumstance. There were some upgrades that were done at one of their really large units, Song, San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. And the, uh, after the upgrades were made, there were some vibration issues. There were safety issues that arose out of that. It really became a challenge for that particular unit. Uh, El Diablo, which is the, the last remaining one that will close by 2025, I think, is partially market, partially political pressures in the state. Um, I would have, when I was at FERC, I would have California uh, state officials in my office and we'd talk about that and I'd say, folks, I don't, I don't see how you meet your, your carbon goals and your reliability goals losing all of this, this nuclear power. And I think there's a number of folks in California who are concerned about it um, because you, in the utility business, you need to be planning out 10, 15 years Ahead. I mean, that 15 years is like tomorrow in the, right. in the energy business, when it, with the amount of time it takes infrastructure to get built. And I'm very concerned about California on some of those really hot days after the sun goes down and they still need 
the, uh, and they still need the energy, something has to give. Um, this is a little bit of an aside, but Germany went through exactly this same issue. Uh, and I was, when I was at the FERC, had talked to some um, colleagues who were European regulators. And they had predicted, because Germany had gone through a big energy transition, and uh, in, in Germany their big sources of energy were increasingly renewables, uh, a lot of coal and some nuclear. Um, nuclear is probably even more unpopular in Germany than it is in in California. Does he know why? Or well, he or she? Was? Well, so they and they said, look, so Germany committed to shutting down nukes, shutting down coal, um, and they were going to try to do it with uh, only renewables. But this person was predicting, but it's not going to work because push comes to shove, people want energy, and he said, out of those three, one will have to give. His prediction, and he turned out right, he said his prediction is they will stick with the commitment to shut down nukes because it is that politically un unpalatable mm -hmm. in Germany, but they'll have to do something with coal. And that's kind of what happened is a lot of those coal units have stayed around in, uh, in Germany to be able to keep the lights on. Um, interestingly enough, right across the border in France, France is an extraordinary build out of nuclear power. Most of their grid is based on, on nuclear power. So in order for them to meet some of the commitments with regard to carbon, they have an easier time of it than a lot of their European so, allies. And, and I didn't even ask you here to talk about nuclear, but I'm really curious now. Yeah. So, I mean, when you have one terrible scenario in Three Mile Island, you have right. you have all of this that, that hangs over as though it's some cloud. Uh, but when you talk to people involved in, in nuclear energy and you look at what they do uh, safety-wise, I mean, you, you can't get anyone more focused than than nuclear energy on safety. And so at what point does the nuclear energy industry uh, quit? Be, when are they done having to pay the price for Three Mile Island? Yeah, and it's a, right now the issue in, in nuclear is, is a couple of things. One, the markets often don't, re, as I said before, they don't reward nuclear um, as they probably should in terms of, of the attributes that they, they bring to the system. And there's been some complaints um, from folks in North Dakota that things like coal units don't get adequately compensated in the market. So it's not an unusual comment. Um, so that's part of it. Part of building new nuclear is they are uh, hugely capital intensive. They're very expensive up front to build. So you've got to have some sort of entity willing to invest private capital in it knowing that they're going to sink a lot of money into it up front. But then that unit is going to run for the next 40 or 50 or 60 years at a very low cost um, because the cost of, of the fuel source is, is reasonable and you can predict it out and they're very reliable. Um, and so getting over that capital formation issue can be a bit of a challenge. The other thing is that has stymied some nuclear development is because those units are so expensive to build initially, there's only a certain number of, of entities and utilities that probably have the balance sheet to be able to carry that that sort of uh, that sort of investment, and a lot of utilities just simply aren't large enough to do that. And the other thing is, is nuclear. When you build it, you don't, at least today, you don't build it to add 150 megawatts here, or 250 megawatts yeah. there. You build it to serve 2,000 megawatts all at once because it's it's so big. There are a couple of units coming online, primarily in the southeast, with some utilities that have those larger balance sheets that are be able to build them. One of the things that I think is is really intriguing, and I'm I'm hoping that it it can come about in a cost uh, feasible way, is what they they often talk about small modular reactors, which would be smaller units, sort of like our our nation's navy uh, uh, aircraft carriers are powered on, um, smaller units that you can drop in and might provide you that 250 or 200 megawatts, some smaller unit that that other utilities can can use, and that to me is a really promising technology. Um, but R&D is tough, and yeah. you've got, you know, you've got to, so maybe that's part of the pathway to the future. I've got a minute left. Are we going to have coal 10 years from now, 20 years from now? I think we'll have coal. Um, it will be a little different, probably, and look a little different than it does today. If you look at the grid operators that project these things out in regions that still have coal, they'll, most of their predictions are that there will still be coal in 10 or 15 years. How much is a bit of a question. How much competition are they going to face from natural gas and renewables, which is kind of the main competitors to coal right now? How fast will that energy transition happen? But I see very few scenarios where the engineers who run the grid say there simply won't be coal in, in 10 or 15 years. Making that big a transition 
in that short a time would be very, very tough. But those same engineers are not going to design anything new that involves coal. So that's a secondary question. New coal, is there a future for that? And I would say that the, the, the answer to that is going to be in the technology that comes about that doesn't quite exist today. Um, but there's a lot of progress being made. But in order for new coal to happen, it's going to have to be deal with the carbon issue, uh, no. the emission issues, or else you will not have utilities in all likelihood that are willing to um, invest in that. It's a different set of questions for the legacy coal units that may have useful life, life yet, and um, there may be a pathway for them. The question is how long is that runway going to be? Yeah. Well, I know a lot of people at gasification plant the, uh, that have been trying to clean up coal for a long time, yeah. uh, and it, it still not happened. So um, I hope we have They a make cold. progress, but I hope the carbon so. one is, is, uh, is tricky. It's a great industry for us. Tony, thanks yeah. for coming on. Thanks, Joel. I appreciate it. When we come back, we're going to visit with Jason Wall. Jason is uh, director of the Division of Medical Marijuana, which is what his parents wanted to be one day. Uh, actually, quite frankly, it's an important job and a job that uh, many people count on on a daily basis just to get through with the pain that they have. So stick around, more coming your way as we head down the road. Hey everybody, I'm Doug Billings, your host of The Right Side with Doug Billings on Beck News. We bring you high profile guests, ladies and gentlemen, exclusive guests. Now you're not gonna see these guests in most of the mainstream media outlets. Another thing that I do here is give guests a platform to speak freely. You're not gonna see me censor anybody Please join us, won't you? Weeknights right here on Beck TV and online at Beck.News. Cheers. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. The first night you sleep on my sheets, you'll never want to sleep on anything else. Go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen right now to get your very own MyPillow Giza Dream sheets. When you buy one set of sheets, you'll get another set absolutely free. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Introducing the Cool Turtle, the ultra comfortable mask enhancer that creates a protective, cool, and breathable space between your mask and your face. Simply slide under any mask or gaiter and immediately feel the refreshing pocket of air surrounding your face. Cool Turtle's ergonomically designed soft, comfortable shell immediately reduces mask friction, allowing you to breathe and talk in a comfortable environment. I can actually breathe. With the Cool Turtle, no more sweating. It's like I don't even have a mask on. Call now and get not one, not two, but three cool turtles for just $10. Order now and we'll send you two more cool turtles free. No fees, absolutely free. Plus, you can get a 10-pack of four-ply face masks. Just pay a separate fee. This offer is not available on Amazon. Get the real cool turtle now. Call 1-800-270-1219. That's 1-800-270-1219. Or visit at coolturtle.com. Order now. <laughs> We're the ladies of another view, bringing you a fresh view on local issues. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Oh my gosh. Isn't that, that the most condescending, crazy. rude email you've ever um, received? Well, welcome to National the third News. term of a certain president. I really believe that. And different perspectives you won't get on the mainstream media. Watch us weekday afternoons at 4.30 Central Time on Beck News and at Beck.News. Hey Bucks fans, if you're planning an outing, birthday, or employee appreciation night, then bring your group out to the Bucks Stop for a night of fast-paced, high-scoring football. Your group will receive discounted tickets, options for reserved seating, scoreboard messages, VIP services, swag, and a space to gather during the game. You can also participate in pre-game ceremonies, halftime entertainment, in-game contests, and more. Call 701-595-0771 or visit bismarckbucks.com forward slash tickets. All GA is first come, first serve. We'll see you on the turf. Go Bucks! As I said before the uh, break, Jason Wall has an important job. He really does. It's, it's probably a job that he didn't uh, leave college for and say, you know what, I'm going to end up being the director of medical marijuana uh, in the state of North Dakota. But that doesn't change the fact that many people count on him for it. You might remember that North Dakota overwhelmingly said 
we want medical marijuana. We know of its use, we know what it does, and a lot of people count on it. I'm going to bring Jason in for a conversation. Jason, good to have you coming down the road with us. Thank you for having me. I, I want to go backwards first, Jason. I want to go back to what North Dakotans said. And, and I, I don't want recreational marijuana to be clouded into to what you're doing here. That isn't what this conversation is about. This conversation is about North Dakotans saying, on a daily basis, I'm dealing with pain. And I don't want to take pain uh, killers. I want to take something natural. And so they take marijuana. What do you hear? What do you see in terms of the need, in terms of what, why people voted for this? Um, I don't want to speak for everyone who voted in relation um, to the initiated measure back in November of 2016. Uh, but ultimately, as we've been implementing the program, we have heard a lot of different stories from a lot of diverse backgrounds of the citizens of North Dakota looking for an alternative to help them with a symptom or a condition that they have that they just haven't been able to find relief or find something that helps them get by um, through their healthcare providers in the medical community. Um, I think there's been a lot of positives in regards to individuals who have had success using uh, marijuana and marijuana products purchased at registered dispensaries. Um, I would say certainly with the growth of our patient population, um, I think more and more people are seeing that, you know, maybe this is something I want to try. Maybe early on it was that I'm not interested in the program, but I'm starting to hear from my neighbor or a colleague or another relative that, you know, this is starting to work. So, you know, we are over 5,600 registered patients now, uh, which to us shows that the program continues to grow and expand. Uh, our budget had projected we'd be at 4,000 patients at the end of this month. Uh, so we have seen a significant growth in the program in the last two years. So that begs the question then, how do they go about applying to be to be one of that 5,600? And, uh, you know, where do they get it? How do they find the marijuana? So if someone were to call our office in regards to, you know, I'm interested in obtaining a card. First thing we're going to tell them is you need to have a discussion with your health care provider. Now, a health care provider under the laws for the program are either a physician, a physician assistant, or an advanced practice registered nurse. Uh, they do have to be licensed in the state of North Dakota, not necessarily reside in North Dakota, but they do need to be licensed by the state. Um, following that conversation, then they can go to our division website and are able to complete an application online. Um, in that application, they'll give us their healthcare provider's name and email address. That healthcare provider then gets an email to complete their portion of that application. Once we receive all the information, we're able to do some verification work and then approve, and they'll get a card in the mail. They also have access to an electronic card, um, so they don't have to wait in case their mail doesn't come very often. I don't know if you've noticed, mail's a little slower these days. <laughs> yeah, so, it is. Uh, we do see a number of individuals, new patients, that are going to a registered dispensary um, the next day after we approve their card. And we know that they haven't received it in the mail yet. So um, they are able to go to any one of the eight registered dispensaries in the state. And they are scattered in the major cities, or those eight are located in the eight major cities across North Dakota, um, established that way to help uh, cut down on travel as best we could, but they can go to any one of the eight to purchase products. They always have to show their card when they walk in the door to make sure uh, that the dispensary validates them, um, that they still are a current patient, so we don't end up with an individual that doesn't have a valid card. Getting into what we refer to as the restricted access area or kind of the point of sale where they have a conversation with dispensary uh, representatives um, all first-time patients coming into a dispensary are offered a consultation. Um, they can go into a consultation room. They do a patient intake form. Um, some individuals take advantage of that. Others, um, I would say, know what has worked for them in the past, um, maybe from another state. 
or from use of this back in the 80s. We don't ask questions where they would have received it back then, um, but they certainly <laughs> have the knowledge and experience in regards to the use of products. Yeah, so, okay, uh, that, more questions then. Uh, you say eight dispensaries that they can go to. Um, is it limited? I mean, is it limiting? I mean, there's a lot of people that might want in to get into the business. Uh, how do they go about that process? Um, in regards to the eight dispensaries, that is a legislative decision. Uh, state law for the program established a maximum of eight dispensaries. Unless the Department of Health identifies that there needs to be an increase to access to marijuana. Um, right now with the 5,600 patients and the eight dispensaries, we're not there yet where we're looking at establishing another dispensary. However, that time may come as the program continues to evolve and grow. If that were to happen, we would have uh, an announcement, an open application period where people would be able to apply similar to what we did a few years ago when we established um, application rounds for people to apply to obtain a registration certificate. So is there a limit to the amount that they can get? Is that part of that healthcare provider saying, look, uh, here's your prescription, here's how much you can have, or is it, look, I qualify for medical marijuana, I'm gonna to go to the dispensary and get as much as I want. So state law does identify the maximum amount that registered patients can purchase in a 30 day period. It's a rolling 30 day period. Um, so our information technology system tracks purchases in real time. So we are able to ensure that patients don't go over the amounts that are set in state law. Um, you did happen to mention the P word, which is a word in our program that we always try to um, tell people doesn't exist and that's a prescription. This still is a federal illegal drug at this time. Uh, where the federal government's gonna go with marijuana, it kinda depends on who you ask at this point in time. Um, but at the way the program is able to operate and why the federal government continues to allow states to have these programs is through the use of certain terminology and having a well-regulated program. So no prescriptions, healthcare provider simply is stating on that written certification that yes, this individual has a qualifying debilitating medical condition and then is completing a couple of check boxes. Then they're allowed to go and purchase up to two and a half ounces of dried leaves and flowers as well as 4,000 milligrams of THC and the other products that are available, such as your waxes, shatters, capsules, uh, vape cartridges, and lotions. Okay. So when you said I did mention the P word, I was trying to remember when I said pot. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, but last question, I promise. But uh, in terms of the quality of the marijuana, uh, it, it's my understanding, and people can take it as my word or not, that I don't smoke marijuana, but the quality, there's different levels of um, strength when it comes to marijuana. If that's the truth, how do you guard against or for that? Um, our state doesn't specifically identify a maximum amount of THC in dried leaves and flowers. So whatever one of the two manufacturing facilities are able to grow in the THC that is um, tested, and that number comes from a lab that the Department of Health has a contract with, they actually go into the manufacturing facility, make a sample or make a selection of a lot and then test that. So that THC amount, there isn't a maximum amount on. So it does range. Um, THC levels in marijuana are significantly higher than they were 20, 30 years ago. You know, somebody told me at one point from another state that they think the marijuana back in the Woodstock days was probably right around five to 7% THC that qualifies as a pediatric product under our program today. Wow. Pediatric programs are at 6% THC. So we'll see THC levels in the mid to high 20s um, in dried leaves and flowers, but in the concentrates, you're looking at 80% to low 90% THC in some products. Uh, and trust me, uh, and I'm not giving up the name and law enforcement can call me and this is past the statute of limitations, but I know somebody that smoked marijuana uh, and she said uh, it was a whole lot stronger then than she ever remembered to the point where she didn't want to ever do it again. Uh, you know, Jason, come back. When we call you, let's have a, a larger conversation about this, okay? 
be happy to do so. Appreciate your time today. As you can tell, uh, Jason Wall runs a, a good department and understands the science behind it. Uh, done professionally. When we come back, Mary Masted's going to join us. She's the boss when it comes to the Southwest Water Authority. I've known Mary for years. We're going to visit right after this. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. I started by using the world's best cotton called Giza. It's only grown in a region between the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Nile River. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. My Giza sheets also include full 21 inch wide pillowcases that will fit over any pillow and deep pocket sheets that will fit over any mattress. The first night you sleep on my sheets, you'll never want to sleep on anything else. Go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen right now to get your very own MyPillow Giza Dream Sheets. Giza Dream Sheets are available in a variety of colors. Use your promo code and for a limited time, when you buy one set of sheets, you'll get another set absolutely free. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Non attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. This drug remains approved by the FDA. If you or a loved one regularly took Zantac and were later diagnosed with cancer, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. Potential cancers include bladder cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer. Do not stop taking a prescribed medication without first consulting with your doctor. Discontinuing a prescribed medication without your doctor's advice can result in injury or death. Call 1 800 230 9210. Seniors, are you aware that you could pay less for your car insurance? Seniors can save money on their car insurance. You might save a little, you might save a lot. Maybe hundreds of dollars a year. You might save 5% a year, maybe 10%, 15%, or even more. That's a lot of money. So call right now and find out just how much money you might be able to save. 1-800-699-0761. one 800 699 Hi, it's me, Anthony Sullivan, and yes, you've actually caught me at home relaxing because life's been pretty worry-free since I got coverage with American Residential Warranty. You won't believe what ARW covers. Heating and air conditioning, washers and dryers, kitchen appliances, plumbing, water heaters, electrical systems, flat screens and laptops, even pools and spas, and so much more. Call American Residential Warranty. They'll get you covered. 1-800-219-1467. I'm Rick Becker from No Apologies. Welcome to your After Hours Oasis of Sanity. How can, how can these people not see that they're just clowns? We help simplify and educate you on things going on in the legislature and around the country. Asking the hard hitting questions. But also having flea stack and Sid and Marty Croft stuff and we've talked about that sometimes. <laughs> it's bad. Watch us weeknights at 9 central on Beck News and online at Beck.News. You know, my wife constantly uh, rolls her eyes whenever I get back to discussions on what I call rural water, uh, water authorities, water districts, whatever. It's one of the most... Um, so it's one of the times in my life that I'm the most proud of. I started as a young man, and uh, in the end, we ended up taking real water in the system that I managed out to as many as six to seven counties. And so that's a lot of growth. Now, if you want to look at a water district, if you want to look at a water authority that serves a huge geographic area, uh, then you've got to look to the Southwest Water Authority. Mary Massett is, is the boss. When it comes to that, Mary is the CEO of the Southwest Water Authority, and she's my friend. I'm going to bring her in. Mary, good to have you coming down the road with us. Oh, well, it's great to be here with you, Joel. It's been a while. I've and, missed you. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who have never met Mary, she has the collection of the most beautiful hats you're ever going to see. And it's one of the things I love about her the most. If you see Mary, you're just waiting to see a new one. Uh, and it's tip your head down, Mary, so they can see how there. That's how gorgeous that hat is. So, how many do you own? Oh, more than a hundred. Uh, maybe less than two hundred. <laughs> so you could be the head of the Philippines uh, 
wife, and you could have that many <laughs> I just love oh, it. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't want to be a Melda. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mary, here's what, one of the reasons we asked you on. Um, you participated in the 31st annual Berkeley Springs International Water Tasting uh, in West Virginia. Third place. Third place for best uh, municipal water uh, was taken by your uh, Southwest Water Authority. Did, were you screaming? Were you hooting and hollering? Were you high fiving? Because if oh, you yes, you should have been. Yes, we're just very excited. You know, here in Southwest North Dakota, water makes all the difference in the world, as you know. Uh, we've entered Berkeley Springs contest for several years now. We've placed off, and I think this is the best we've ever done. Uh, so, yes, we're third best tasting quality wa uh, drinking water, tap water, anywhere in the world. Uh, it's what we do. This water came out of our new treatment plant in Dickinson. We now have three treatment plants, Joel. Um, and you're right, it's, uh, it's just exciting. No. We always say we have the best tasting, best quality water anywhere in the world, right here in southwest North Dakota. So you might be sitting there, folks, saying, well, okay, how big is this? Let me give you an example. Nine judge judges choose from among entries in 19 states, okay, three Canadian provinces, and 14 other countries. In fact, the winner was uh, a city in Australia, which means you're up against all of it. Mary, uh, th that I think yeah. says even more. Yes, we are. In fact, they have uh, entries from, I think, six continents now. So it's multinational, it's international, it's wonderful. I love and it. we're doing it here in Southwest North Dakota. Uh, here, here's another thing that uh, the folks in Southwest North Dakota that uh, are my age or older, uh, and hopefully that new generation takes for granted what you're doing. Uh, but I was part of the legislature and I was part of the water industry when we were trying to get the money to Southwest Water Authority because the water there was so bad. It was so bad. It, it looked like tar sand. I mean, the, the folks there used to do a great job of coming to the legislature and bringing that Kerr jar in uh, with total black water and that's what you showered in. That's what you, you know, th that was the water in uh, Southwest water. And so now, Mary, I'm guessing that the people that are on it just take it for granted, which is a good thing. In a lot of ways it is, yes. People don't think about it until they turn it on and nothing comes out, kind of like your power switch, you know? Um, it's, uh, it's amazing what a change it has made throughout our region. And you talk about the size of our project. You know, we cover about 15,000 square miles, 12 counties in southwest North Dakota. So we go from Montana to the Missouri River uh, and down to South Dakota. We serve Perkins County in South Dakota. We also tie in the Missouri West water system. We serve a population of, of, of about 56,000 people directly off the of Southwest. We serve 33 communities now and about over 7,300 rural customers. Well, and we also, also, go ahead. Go, well, and I wanna stress how you do it, uh, but, but you finish what you were saying first before I go uh, down the mechanical side. Okay, well, um, besides that, we have raw water customers that are along our raw water line, and uh, we have two raw water depots available, uh, raw water customers, uh, small business customers, everything from Baker Boyd to Assumption Abbey. Um, it, we provide water to primary sector manufacturing, and um, yeah, it's just a great project. Our intake is up at Lake Sakakawea. We are building a second intake. Um, we've got over 5,000 miles of pipe in the ground throughout the region. Well, We're, so the, the wine I buy at Assumption Abbey is made with your water. I'll say yes, it is. So <laughs> see, that's what makes it wonderful. Exactly, absolutely. Uh, Mary, to me, a lot of people, you know, kind of, like I said, take it for granted. Uh, and maybe that my children's generation and younger, I mean, my girls are in their mid thirties now, uh, but their generation and younger, I don't even, I don't even know if they understand the mechanical side of what you do, how many miles of 
pipeline that you have so that you can get to that farm and get to that ranch. And Southwest Water was always one of the big challenges because it's a long way between the light poles uh, in Southwest Water. And so to accomplish that, you've got to have a whole lot of miles of, uh, of water line out there. Yes, we certainly do. Like I said, it's over 5,000 miles, over 5,300. We now have uh, 29 tanks. We're just awarding today, hopefully, a new tank at Taylor uh, Water Reservoir. Uh, so yes, it's an amazing project. We've been under construction since 1986. Our first water service was to Dickinson in 1991, and we're still under construction, Joel. You're going to be under construction when you retire, and there's a lot of tread le left on that tire. You're going to be working in this industry for a long time yet, but Southwest Water is always going to be under construction. I would agree, yes. You know, we've we've served our areas pretty much but we are at capacity in many areas so we're taking a three-pronged approach now we're increasing our water capacity on the raw water side uh, we're also increasing capacity for our main transmission lines we're doing hydraulic system improvements we have waiting lists that range monthly it changes from five to about 750 people i'm even on our waiting list i'm waiting to get another <laughs> hookup you don't <laughs> abuse your power mary congratulations again uh, you know someday it's going to be number one but number three with all of those countries it says a lot yes so, yes doesn't it yes you bet. and you know hats off to my staff yeah. our, our board and you know, thank you, Joel, for all you did for us in the legislature and and helping us. That's something we'll never forget. Well, Mary, you, do, you run a good ship. So thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful. Mary Massett. Hey. Yeah. Uh, How's that? <laughs> you bet. Nice and clear. Uh, so yes, I appreciate we can it. see the bottom. <laughs> We're going to close out our trip down the road right after this. Do you worry about going to the dentist? After all, a visit to the dentist can easily cost $2,000 or more. Well, relax. The Carefree Dental Card is now available in your area. Call now and we'll send your actual card at no cost today. With the Carefree Dental Card, you go to the dentist whenever you need and you instantly pay a lot less. Activate your card and you can start using it immediately. From exams and cleanings to more expensive procedures like crowns, dentures, even braces, they're all included with the Carefree Dental Card. Say you go to the dentist today without any card and your bill is, well, ouch. Wait a minute, let's try that again. You go to the dentist today and show your Carefree Dental Card, you save $525. The Carefree Dental Card is just $15.95 a month, so call now and make going to the dentist carefree. Call 1-800-416-5739 to receive your Carefree Dental Card information kit. 1-800-416-5739 Call now. I can't say enough good things about these nano hearing aids. Real people talking about nano hearing aids. The hearing quality is great. Until now, hearing aids used to be too expensive for the average person. Until nano. Call now and you'll get your nano hearing aids for only $297. You'll save $100. When you buy one hearing aid, nano will give you a second hearing aid free. Call right now. 1-800-213-3815. Come to know and trust us for over 18 years with the largest selection and showroom in Western North Dakota for our beautiful Sundance spas. Plus, you can pick out your next home experience with our selection of pool tables, shuffle boards, and fun accessories. Spas, etc. Your relaxation destination on Maine and Bismarck. Who do you trust with your digital life? Not all cloud backup providers keep your data truly private. Beck Cloud Backup uses advanced multi-layer encryption to keep your family photos, videos, and sensitive business documents secure and only for your eyes. Your Beck Lightband Internet service already includes 50 gigs of free storage to keep your digital life safe and secure. Call us at 701-475-2361 to start using your Beck Cloud Backup today. Attention, have you or a loved one suffered from maculopathy, a serious retinal injury, after taking the prescription drug Elmiron for interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome? 
In 2018, a researcher at the Emory School of Medicine linked l -Myron, a prescription drug that treats interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome to maculopathy, which is sight-threatening and can cause an abrupt change of vision. Call l -Myron Justice for a free legal consultation. Please call 800-395-5680. You know, we covered a lot of things today as we headed down the road together, but there's one thing in particular I want to back up to. I do. Jason Wallen, the job that he does uh, in North Dakota administering and overseeing medical marijuana. You know, we have a lot of people in our North Dakota prison system. We have a lot of people in our national, uh, our nation's prison system, a lot of people that could be out working, a lot of people that are in there because of the sale of marijuana and the use of marijuana. So, I, you know, I'm glad I come from a state where they recognize the positive uses of marijuana. I am. I, I'm glad that I come from a state where uh, we have medical marijuana, where it can help people that are in pain, where a doctor, a nurse practitioner, you know, as you just heard, or if you go back to our podcast at Beck News, you can, you can see if you're just joining us, um, the, the, the process you go about and the individuals that are able to take it because they have gone to see a physician. They have gone to see a nurse practitioner. You know, we're going to get to recreational marijuana. We're going to get there. I, I think most of you know that. And, and let me give you an example of why. I worked with a gentleman who is, I think, in his mid-70s now, maybe his early 70s. He fought for this country in Vietnam. First time he ever smoked marijuana was in Vietnam. And you know what? He still smokes marijuana today. He does. I don't know if he's on the medical marijuana list or if he's just on the go ahead and try to catch me list. I know this. Uh, I know that he enjoys marijuana. He doesn't drink alcohol. He doesn't. He smokes pot. And you know who he hurts by doing that? And I'm serious about this. You know who he hurts? Nobody. Nobody. This is a man who fought for this country. This is a man in a whole lot of pain. This is a man who gets high every now and then. And I think we're going to go where South Dakota already went. We're going to have recreational marijuana in North Dakota. Good riding with you, folks.